Hello, United Methodist men. My name is Odell Horn, and I am the Director of Communications for the North Georgia Conference United Methodist Men. And today, we are going to have a conversation with the Reverend Dr. Scott Hughes on the topic of epiphany. We're going to be talking about the revelation of the king. And so what we want to do is look at how epiphany, this, this time where magi from the east came and brought gifts to the soon coming king, the Messiah, the baby Jesus, and what role that plays in the Christian life, but also how that has been interpreted and misinterpreted. So let's start with scripture. I'm reading from Matthew chapter two, and we're going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version updated edition. And I'm going to read about the first 12 verses. So bear with me. It says, in the time of King Herod, after which Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And coming together, all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, and you Bethlehem and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is it to uh, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me words so that I may also go and pay homage, pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went uh, the star that had been seen in the east until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The, the question some may be asking, Christmas is over, and now Three Kings Day has passed. Why are we talking about Epiphany? Because this is traditionally celebrated on January 6th, and that is a sacred and religious holiday and is mainly celebrated in Latin America as Three Kings Day and, and in other Eastern Orthodox countries uh, such as Greece, but they may have a different date, but they do celebrate Epiphany. And so this is a day in which in some countries, gifts are exchanged, not on Christmas Day, but on Three Kings Day or on Epiphany. And yet, January 6th has taken on a new meaning in the United States. And so we wanted to bring in the Reverend Dr. Scott Hughes, who the Director of Adult Discipleship at Discipleship Ministries in Nashville, Tennessee. Scott has a Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of West Georgia and a Master's of Divinity degree from Asbury Theological Seminary as well as a doctorate of ministry degree from Southern Methodist University, and he's an elder in full connection in the North Georgia Conference. So Scott, welcome to this conversation. Thanks so much, Odell, Thanks for so having well, me. And always a pleasure always. to do stuff with the North Georgia Annual Conference. Yes, I pastored in North Georgia for 13 years before coming to Discipleship Ministries in 2015. I started as Director of Adult Discipleship, and currently and my title is Associate General Secretary as of a few months ago, um, so that um, has been a, a fun transition, uh, learning more and more about uh, the expansive connection that we have 
Uh, but yeah, it's great to do things with the North Georgia Conference. Um, have so many friends and uh, and others in this con in in North Georgia. So a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, and and I apologize. I introduced you with the wrong title. Congratulations on the promotion. That's okay. No worries. It's it's a title. It's you know it's it's all doing ministry. Mm hmm. Tell me, what churches did you uh, pastor while you were here in North Georgia? Sure. So I had the pleasure of serving at Douglasville First United Methodist Church for nine years as an associate under two different senior pastors. And then prior to that, I had a three-point circuit for four years. I guess technically it was three churches for three years. And then the last year, we I had two because we closed one of the churches. So that was an interesting experience in closing um, a church that had been around for 150 years or more. So um, and then Barnesville is the bottom end of the district. So I remember when I got the call from Jim Mitchell, for those who remember, who know Jim Mitchell, that was my first district superintendent and said, you're being appointed to the Barnesville circuit. And I had to get out a map. And of course, at this time, that's what it was. It was a physical map. I had to get out a map and find Barnesville there at the bottom end of the district. But we were loved on there and both our kids were born there. So it, it you know, I was very appreciative of the two appointments I got to serve in North Georgia. Thank you for that. Now tell us, what do you do specifically at Discipleship Ministries? What do you do? That is a good question. Um, don't ask my kids. They don't, they don't know either. Um, so as Associate General Secretary, I relate to the World Service side of Discipleship Ministries. Um, some may know Upper Room is housed under Discipleship Ministries. Upper Room is an ecumenical organization um, by the Book of Discipline housed in Discipleship Ministries. Um, and so I'm I'm the Associate General Secretary for the World Service side. So we've got several teams, and I help manage those teams and produce resources for um, church leaders. So our, our mission is to support and challenge annual conference and local church leaders in their task of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we do take that very seriously, that we have the opportunity to challenge and support church leaders and, and discipleship. And it's such an honor to work with bishops, annual conference staff, church leaders, laity and clergy to help in this task of making disciples. That is our passion. That is what we strive to do. Um, and, it, and it's a joy to see the church at work uh, when it works and the connection when it works and uh, be a part of some of the good things that are happening in the Methodist church. I know we hear lots of uh, bad stories sometimes, and stories of disaffiliation are dominating the news, uh, but it is a joy to see when the connection works and a joy to see when God is moving in and through the people um, called United Methodist. So that, that's a snapshot of what I get to do. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, I got in touch with you because you had written for Discipleship Ministries mm -hmm. um, an article a curriculum, actually not an article, a curriculum for small groups on how to have a conversation around Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism. Uh, tell me why you wrote that, uh, and then we'll get in some questions as, into Epiphany. Yeah, great. Yeah. So when I started, I began a project that I called Courageous Conversations. And Courageous Conversations, my shorthand for that, is Structured Dialogues for Learning. As director of adult discipleship, I was asking the question, how do adults learn? And what I found was oftentimes it's through questioning assumption, it's in conversation with others, it's in self-discovery, and much of the way we're taught that we learn often looks like a download of information. Sometimes we do learn in that way, but oftentimes it's when we're challenged to question our assumptions. It's in conversations with people we trust. And so I began creating a toolbox of resources to help churches have structured dialogues for learning around various topics. Now, this was in 2015, so this was pre-Donald Trump. This was pre-General Conference 2019. And so all of these things began adding. And so I, I began expanding as I had time, courageous conversation resourcing. And then after January 6th, I partnered uh, with some folks to create a Courageous Conversation sample outline on Christian nationalism, because I saw that, uh, as I saw statistics, this is evident in some of our churches, sometimes as uh, those who are adherents and sometimes those who are referred to as sympathizers, 
Um, that total group is roughly around 30% or so, um, you know, when we talk generally of the United Methodist Church, um, something along those lines is what we're talking about. And so um, how do we create conversation to, uh, to challenge Christian nationalism, to um, have healthy dialogue so that we're not just condemning people and beating people over the head, but how do we lovingly um, and honestly have conversation so that we are who God is wanting us to be and we're clear about what the gospel is inviting us into and clear when perhaps there's a different gospel being proclaimed. Um, and so how do we have conversation to, to guide that is one piece of uh, the Courageous Conversations project was the sample outline on Christian nationalism. And so thank you for that. Just to be clear, uh, this is a uh, it's a, you wrote the sample outline, but this is also it's a part of a larger series of courageous conversations for churches to have on different topics. Correct. It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. And oftentimes, oftentimes it might be a social issue. Um, gun violence, climate change, climate justice and so forth. Sometimes it's like just the color of the carpet issues. Right. How do we structure ourselves to have those conversations well? And my hope is, as we learn to have those conversations well, we become better disciples. We become better disciples when we listen well. We become better disciples when we can extend compassion to others. So for me, this is very much about discipleship, not just how do we speak civilly to one another, but how do we grow as disciples that we can be more attentive to God's work in our lives, in the life of others, and in the world around us. So there is a bit of discernment um, components to courageous conversations as well. And that, that's why, right, is to help us as disciples of Jesus Christ be more attentive to God's presence and where he's speaking and how we be the community God is calling us to be. Thank you. And just for a uh, note, uh, we used your uh Courageous conversations regarding the future of the United Methodist Church with the North Georgia Conference United Methodist Men. And we appreciate you for giving us the structure on how to have that conversation and still uh, have discipleship as the heart of that conversation, even if we walked away with disagreeing. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. We are better informed and, and we still have discipleship as our center. Yeah, that's right. And I'm glad you mentioned that, right? Because the, the point is not group think. The point isn't to all to agree. That's not likely to happen anyway, right? But but how do we hear better? How do we listen to each other better? How do we be better disciples um, and, and grow in our own perspective of what we believe and also what others believe, right? And so I, I try to distinguish what's happening in a courageous conversation so that people don't get antsy and think they're just going to make me think a certain way. In fact, I would say a good courageous conversations would lift up the differences and distinctions and perspectives that are there. And so that we can um, love one another well. Um, and secondarily, you know, how can we all be challenged? How can we be uh, allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to come uh, and not uh, point fingers and blame and uh, those things that we're often too used to. Thank you for that. Now let's let's get to uh, Epiphany. We read the scripture in Matthew uh, chapter two. Uh, tell me your understanding of the scripture and, and tell me your understanding of Epiphany. And now this intersectional um, piece that American uh, of American politics. Mm. That's big, right? There's a lot to unravel there. That's a, yeah, lots of layers to this. So let, yeah, let's start with the scripture passage. And it's, it's, a, it's a great passage. I mean, obviously, right? And, and epiphany, a revelation, right? And what's interesting, and this is true, I think, throughout Matthew's gospel, is we see glimpses of non-Israelites, non-Jewish folks who are getting a glimpse of, of who God is and what God is up to. And here we see these magi, astrologers, um, who are not Jewish, right? I mean, that, that's clear. Um, 
And yet they're the ones that fall down at Jesus's feet and worship him and give gifts. And then Herod, the for all due respect, the, the Jewish authority, uh, the one in power, doesn't kneel. In fact, he goes on to commit um, infanticide, right? Like he, he he is abusing his power. And so it's interesting to see this split between the religious authorities who should get it, who should be able to see what God's up to, miss it, and, and in fact, go a completely different way, whereas these Gentiles are the ones. Now, we don't know how many there were. There were three gifts. We don't know how many magi there were. A fun trivia fact for you. Um, but they're the ones who worship, right? The ones without power, the ones that shouldn't get it, are those who get it. And I think that's really interesting as we think about uh, the implications of that in terms of how we think about politics. And I think it's probably worth stating up front when I use the word politics, how I'm using that term. We are political animals. Politics in the sense of how we are together uh, as a nation state. That's the way I'm using politics. The way I often hear politics used is much more along the lines of partisanship, right? Our, the our biblical theological foundations have political implications. That does not mean we should ever be partisan, right? Those are separate things. And so sometimes I hear people say, well, we shouldn't be political. We can't help but be political, right? That's who we are, just anthropology. Logically speaking, we are political animals. We are in communion with others in nation states. Um, and politics matters, right? What policy, policies affect real people in real ways, tangible ways. And so we absolutely should be involved in politics. Um, now, how that looks gets really interesting. And we can dive into some of that with regard to Christian nationalism and especially in regards to church state separation, right? That's one of the in our founding documents, we believe. Um, Christian nationalism blurs that line a little bit. Um, so we could go down that rabbit hole and if that trek of you if you want to, but bringing it back to the passage, at least I'll try and do that, is this revelation of who Jesus is, is, is what's central. Uh, this, this one who is king, this baby, right? And king, right, is, is interesting language, especially for us in America, because we don't have kings. Uh, we, we elect our leaders, um, and here Jesus is, is king. So it's not really a, we have some concept of it, of what a king is, but it would have been very um, confrontive, right? If you're Herod, that there's a king, another king is a direct confrontation. Um, and what we see throughout the Gospels then is not only is Jesus confronting uh, Jewish and religious elites, it's Caesar himself, right? The, the head of the Roman Empire, right? The early, earliest confession we see in scriptures, Jesus is Lord. So we typically think of that as a religious statement. In the first century, that would have been overtly political because Caesar was says to be Lord. To say Jesus is Lord was first and foremost a political statement with religious implications and obviously political implications. And so there's all this, I think, underneath the, the first reading of this passage, there's all these dynamics about power and politics and allegiance. Um, uh, allegiance, uh, we use the word, it's translated often faith in scripture, and we often think of that as belief. And, and that's not wrong. I think a m more accurate description might be allegiance, right? We pledge our allegiance to Jesus, right? We have faith, we have trust in our loyalty, our fidelity belongs to Jesus. We are first and foremost citizens of, of God's realm or God's kingdom. His, his de, God's dominion, right, is first and foremost for him. So that puts Christians at an awkward, I think, awkward, tenuous relationship with whatever nation they find themselves in, because their first allegiance is to Jesus, is to the, the kingdom that Jesus preached, right? Jesus's main message was the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. 
right? That is, that's Jesus's main message. And, and so if that's our first allegiance, the kingdom, God's king, God's realm that is being burst forth and will come in fullness in one day, that creates an awkward tension with then how are we citizens of earthly kingdoms when our primary allegiance is to God's kingdom? I've said a lot. <laughs> uh, tell me what's stuck in, in that, uh, Odell, where you want, you'd like me to expand or, or maybe even challenge me. I'm curious um, your thoughts so far. Now, this is good because I want to go back. Uh, I want to trace this, this thought of Jesus is Lord um, mm -hmm. as a political statement through the New Testament, because yeah. we clearly I've been reading through the book of Acts and we clearly see in Acts chapter one. Uh, and even before we get to Pentecost or, or the right before Pentecost, the disciples asking Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? Right. Talk right. to me about that. And then uh, we see in the book of Revelation, Jesus will be the soon coming king. Uh, so this this return of Christ. But talk to me about what it meant for Israel in the first century to have a Messiah. And if Jesus was that Messiah, uh, he's making not just a religious statement, but a political statement. So tell me there, there the tension between that and then uh, talk about revelation and, and Jesus, the lion and the lamb, the, uh, the soon coming King. Tell me, let's trace this through the new Testament. Yeah, that's great. And I always like talking about the book of revelation. So I'll, Try and talk about Acts first. Um, yeah, so that's a, it's such an interesting comment we see from the disciples, the disciples, right? Not like occasional followers that kind of heard some of what Jesus said. Jesus's followers, right? And it, it shows us what's going on in their head, their their worldview that when the Messiah comes, God's kingdom would come, God's realm would come in fullness, and they notice. That hasn't happened. <laughs> all that has happened, I, mean, I, I say all, um, I'm using that, I guess, a narrow sense. You know, Jesus has died, was, you know, and, and this is probably an important point, especially as we look ahead towards Revelation. Jesus dies on a Roman cross. I mean, I'll let that sink in for a minute, right? Um, who's at fault for Jesus' death? And, and I, I think what the gospel writers show us is it's the political realm and the religious realm as a way of saying, in a sense, all of us are involved in Jesus's death. Um, but we see, you know, clearly Rome was involved. In, in, um, and so now he's been resurrected, which was, again, probably a world, you know, a redefining event because the way Jews at the time thought of resurrection is that all the dead would rise. And here only one has risen. And so there's this confusion. What does this mean, right? And I think we have some hindsight to say, well, it was a sign uh, to say God's kingdom, God's realm is being birthed, right, through what Jesus is, is doing, and that will continue through the, the disciples and the Holy Spirit that we see in Acts, right? Um, and so they're wondering, all right, Jesus, when is this going to come in fullness? Is in is that now? And are you going to take over and be a physical king? And and it's, in, I mean, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. It's just mind warping to say God's kingdom is not of this world. It doesn't mean it's completely separate. It means the power and the source of it does not originate with the powers here, but originates with God. And that is being birthed in and through uh, the ministry of Jesus and through what is continuing uh, through the disciples on to today, through um, acts of healing, through forgiveness, through uh, as people grow in abundance, the abundant life that Jesus offered. These are all signs that the kingdom is continuing to grow. We think about the parables of the mustard seed, right? That it's seemingly small. We're not quite sure what's happening, but actually it's expanding and growing and getting stronger and growing to this enormous height. And so what we believe is we're looking forward to this one day, Jesus is going to return and that fullness is going to happen. It's, it's beginning now, you know, the now and not yet as we refer to it. And so we look forward to that day when it comes. I think that bridges us then 
to to revelation the the way that i i say i frame this i didn't make this up i got got this from people much smarter than me um, in terms of one of the main questions of the book of revelation is where does your citizenship lie does it lie with the citizenship of, of fallen Babylon or with the new Jerusalem? Where do your values spring out of? Do they spring out of the ways of this world that we know are, are falling away? That's what John's vision is about, is the crumbling of these earthly empires are going away. And what remains, what, what overcomes is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And, and that op somewhat opening scene of uh, four and five, chapters four and five in Revelation, we have this paradoxical, mysterious image of Jesus as both the conquering lion and the slaughtered lamb. And those things are absolutely, <laughs> completely opposite images, but they're held together right? And it's easy to rush to the conquering lion and, and forget that the one that we serve is also the slaughtered lamb. And I think that speaks a lot to how we do things. We don't do things through power and, and trying to do uh, pol uh, grasp political power and political means to an end, but we trust that the, the slaughtered lamb is, is leading us and guiding us and will work his ways and eventually will come. And that that image of the new Jerusalem coming down, I mean, you know, when we get into, you know, unfortunate sort of rapture theologies of us going somewhere else, it's interesting because in Revelation, New Jerusalem is clearly coming down to earth. Um, and it and it's shaped, the way it's described is supposed to echo the holy of holies coming down. Because God's presence coming down and being with us. And one last thing I could go on and on about this. One last thing that I'll just let people puzzle over a little bit is there's 12 gates. Um, gates are usually meant to keep people out, but in this description, the gates are always open. And that's a pretty amazing image of, to me, an invitation, right? Of God saying, the door's always open for you, right? If, if you'll surrender your will, and and come the, the doors open and I, I don't know what what exactly all that means and looks like I think there's some mystery there for us but I do think it's consistent with God's character of inviting the least likely in right I'm not I think of when you go all the way back to the promise with Abram right the, the that you will bless many nations right, and how that expands throughout scripture, and we see in the Old Testament Gentiles being involved, Ruth, Rahab, others, and then when we get to the New Testament, we see these magi. We see um, the Canaanite woman. We see, we, I mean, there's the, the soldier at the cross, right? There's all these glimpses of God's kingdom is a just a little bit bigger than what you, well, not a little bit big. I shouldn't use the word little. It is more expansive than what you're able to comprehend, I think, is part of this, right? And that's, we'll let God figure that out, right? And, but this image of, uh, I think First Peter uses the phrase uh, of where righteousness is at home, right? When the kingdom comes, it's righteousness will be, God's righteousness will be the way that that is, uh, which should give us hope for one day we get to participate in that. All right, I've, I've gone on and on here, Odell. Um, well, that was good. Okay, okay, good. That was good. Let me ask you a question before we uh, bridge the gap, uh, because this is, again, Epiphany. January 6th is a day in which a, a lot of countries exchange gifts on that day. Um, so this is, uh, in some countries, uh, Christmas is seen as, uh, our, our, let me just say our nativity scenes are wrong. Um, the, the, the Magi should be on, if your nativity scene is on the coffee table, then Magi should be on the end table. 
because they're not there uh, at the same time at, at the birth. Because when you're talking about the infanticide that Herod is talking about, um, at, at I've heard two years old. Um, uh, tell me, am I wrong? What what age was Jesus at the time that the Magi actually show up? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that we know, but you're right, right? That right that um, yeah, I, I don't want to throw Francis of Assisi under the bus, who began the um, the first nativity scenes, right? And, and, and was educating people on the story, uh, the birth story of Jesus using the means he had to, which is from the beginning of Russia's and nativity scenes as a way, you know, for people who did not have physical Bibles, right? We have to remember for most of Christian, um, the, most people were, most Christians were illiterate, right? They didn't have personal Bibles until, you know, uh, after the Gutenberg press, right? And so, it was a way of teaching the story physically, you know, and and it was a, at the time a very appropriate way. But you're right. How we now educate is different, right? How we tell the story should match, you know, how we do so today. And so, yeah, I think it would be fun to kind of play with the nativity sets and put things away and then bring them in at appropriate times and talk about why are they further away? Why are they now here? You know, what did, you know, so there's a lot of, I think, of fruit that could, good conversations could happen with how you're thinking about um, the nativity set. And so, yeah, we don't know exactly how old Jesus was. Um, I, I think part of the point, at least I would emphasize, is God's coming in a, an infant, right, who is dependent on others to even exist, that, that God is willing to go to those depths to be with us, to understand our situation, uh, understand our temptations, understand our growth, to understand us in a way not other would be possible. And then, and that in is also Lord of the universe, right? That it's it's a both and that should shape how we think about power, how we think about um, God and what God's kingdom or realm looks like as opposed to the ways earthly realms attempt to grab power and in and, and the church ought to be speaking truth to power, right? We ought to we ought to help display appropriate uses of power and trust and so forth. Was that was that was where that, you were headed that, there? Yeah, that's that's great. I want to uh, shift and I want to talk about um, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who was born in York, uh, which is in England. And prior to Constantine, Christianity was a persecuted religion. And so now uh, we go under from Constantine, I believe he issued the Edict of Toleration uh, in 313. So we go from Jesus as Lord as being a political statement uh, to how, how is that now interpreted with Constantine and eventually the Council of Nicaea and then later on with the Osidosis with in 381 the adoption of christianity as the religion of the empire yeah such a big shift right and as you noted in, in church history especially early church history there are periods sort of waves of persecution waves of tolerance you know depending on who the emperor is depending on a lot of different factors and then we get to constantine things shift right, as opposed to being a minority group, now Christianity is in a place of power, which is a weird place for it to be. Um, and, and as the saying goes, power tends to corrupt, absolute, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Um, and, and we see that not as a problem in Christianity, it happens in other religions too, when those in power use religion for their own purposes. They use religion to, to prop their the purpose of keeping themselves in power. 
of keeping some people subject, right? Of who gets priority over things. And so it creates a real mess of, of power dynamics that Christianity has a really difficult time with um, because of the way we think about power, because we follow a conquering lion and slaughtered lamb, right? That this is a tension that makes it really difficult for difficult. I don't want to say impossible, difficult for, for Christians to be in positions of power. I, I certainly I would not want to um, give the inference that um, Christians shouldn't be part of um, politics. Absolutely, they should. Um, we just have to be mindful of power and what power does to us and can corrupt even our best intentions, right? I mean, I do think a fair analogy here is the, the ring and Lord of the Rings, right? It doesn't matter for what motivation you would want to use it. That ring will corrupt your intentions. And that's the way sin works, right? Sin, we may have one intention, um, but the outgrowth is something else. And, and I think when we're in forms of power, we have to be really careful and mindful of that. Is that hitting that where you're going there, Odell? Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to I want to trace this uh, a little bit further during the early okay. church because then uh, I several years ago I watched a movie called The uh, City of God and it was about uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, which is um, a Brazilian movie. Uh, and it, it talks, uh, and I, I didn't catch on to what they were doing. The sequel to the movie City of God is uh, City of Man. And so it, it's, mm -hmm. it's taking from this work of St. Augustine, of uh, these, these two cities. Tell me, uh, I, wanna, I wanna get to January 6th and the political implications uh, in the United States in this intersection. But I really want to deal with that spiritual first and how I want to sort of trace it through Constantinian Christianity and then uh, also through the time of St. Augustine, his two, tell me a little more about his two cities. Yeah, that, um, I, I'm certainly no uh, Augustinian um, scholar, uh, an authority on him, but yeah, he presents this two rival factions, right? And um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to go too far since I don't know too much about about that, um, but but I do think it's mindful uh, in terms of I mean I think what he's trying to do is wrestle with how do Christians have authority? How do Christians? I mean he's giving some authority to uh, being in power while trying to hold on to the but there's a greater allegiance that we have. There's a greater kingdom that we serve. Um, and, and that's a difficult balance for anyone to maintain. Um, I think that's as far. <laughs> I mean, I, I can jump ahead a little bit to Luther. I know Luther a little better, right? And, and Luther had issues with this, with the Peasants' Revolt. He was pretty fine with the telling the political power, sure, go in, use your power, not, you know, do damage, do harm. Um, and, and, you know, I think now we, we would rightfully cringe at that, right? And say that's probably an inappropriate <laughs> use of of power so there's been this constant strain and of tension in christian history of abuse of power right that that it's there right that that you know um we've been implicated in in abuses of power in the past um and we need to learn our lessons um and obviously we, we don't always learn our lessons about when political power is wielded in ways that is antithetical to the gospel right that that's problematic um has been problematic in the past centuries has been problematic in the past decades even closer to home right that using political power uh, in the name of the gospel is problematic so let me ask you then this question um we haven't talked about this but i'm gonna i'm gonna lead you into this there has been um uh, Nicole Hannah Jones wrote a book called The 1619 Project, and mm -hmm. she's talking about how slavery is the origin of America. And then there was a response called The 1776 Project by Bob Woodson, I believe, 
who uh, came out of the civil rights movement, and he's saying that, uh, no, the origin of, of the United States of this country is uh, the Declaration of Independence. I would posit that both are wrong to some degree, mm. that uh, the origin of this country, which should be properly named the 1607 Project, because folk left England to come to this country. Now, of course, there were people already in this country uh, in 1607. But in terms of what we think of as the founding of America, they were escaping religious persecution in England. And um, that's, that's what I would argue. Talk to me about this new Jerusalem. I'm going to go back to what you were talking about in Revelation. This new Jerusalem concept and how um, Americans view um, this country. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And, you know, just as I'm not an Augustinian scholar, nor am I an American history scholar, I'll do my best uh, um, and would say <laughs> um, do, do your own uh, historical um, research here, but yeah, there, there is, what I would say there was a confluence of influences, a confluence, uh, various um, influences that has shaped America for good and bad, right? And there definitely was a strain of um, seeing America as the, li- the city on the hill, right? A light to the nations. And Jonathan Edwards picks up on this. Ronald Reagan picks up on this, right? It, it's sort of a, it's, it's a, a current amongst other currents that make up the stream of who we are um, as America. And it, it, it leads directly into Christian nationalism because they have very much taken this and run with it to, to the extent of this belief that God has a special relationship with America, Uh, And then Christian nationalism takes it to the next step, which is in order for that that relation, in order for us to receive the blessings of God, we have to be blessable, right? We have to be a certain way in order to continue to receive God's blessing. And if we don't do things, I'm going to use Christian in quotes here, the Christian way, we won't receive blessing from God, right? Which has all kind of problems and implications. And if, I guess one of the things I would say is, as we begin to shift into Christian nationalism, like how to recognize it, here's one of the key ways of recognizing Christian nationalism. And that is reading the Old Testament promises to Israel as if they apply to America today, right? I mean, we, we, I I would say contextually, these are promises made to Israel. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and there's no good exegetical reason to say they now apply to America, right? I don't see that in scripture, right? That contextually, those are promises made at a specific time to a specific place, specific people. Um, and then we could, I think, talk about what are the influences in our Declaration of Independence, our founding documents. And, the, and, and I think we've seen this. I won't give specific examples although I think I could, of how we've seen recent examples of people basically saying the founding documents were not just, didn't just have Christian influence, but almost had such inspiration from God, they're almost at the place of scripture. And historically, as I understand it, there are a myriad of influences to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Certainly, some of it is Christian right? The belief that all are of dignity and worth, right? Prior to this, in other places, only the kings, only the the royalty were seen as having dignity. And part of the American experiment is we believe in in all, right? That we believe all have this, and we have this republic democracy where people can vote and vote people out of office. We have some influence and dignity and, and who is serving the country. Um, so there's some values that, that are at tension there, I guess, is what I'm getting at. If we're going to say these are inspired, anyway, I'm going to stop talking because I'm, I'm <laughs> beginning to go in different directions. So um, questions that I prompted so far, Odell, or maybe um, some that I've hit on you want to expand on? 
Yeah, I want to come back to the New Jerusalem, but you hit on something with the Old Testament uh, and talk to me about Israel being like the other nations in demanding a king when oh, yeah. God clearly articulated he was their king. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the story of Samuel. Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, in a sense, Israel is supposed to be set up as a theocracy, right? God was their king. And the people uh, um, not feeling secure in that, um, not trusting in God enough, I guess is one way to say that, um, demand that there be a king. And uh, the temple doesn't want to go along with that. And uh, eventually they get a king. And, and of course, their first king, Saul, is kind of in their own image, right? He's insecure, right? He always has a spear next to, next to him. He, he's um, trying to take out David. He um, turns, turns inwardly. He's suspicious of other people. He's rash, right? He's a reflection of who they are. Right. And it's not till the, the second king, uh, obviously King David, that uh, helps the nation begin to have some healing and begin to move forward. Um, oh, now I'm, I'm losing your question. So your question um, was on um, the Old Testament and Israel as um, it, it How is a distinct it? time and a distinct Say well, how is it being interpreted? You mentioned it was being interpreted as the promises belong to America now. Talk, talk to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think context. I mean, I mean, let's just take Joshua for instance, right? I mean, I guess it's like this is prior, but right, Joshua's con you know the conquest of the land, right? Um, to to take it over, like to me, and I, I say to me, I think well, the biblical scholars agree with this that. That was a specific command to a specific time and to specific people, right? And um, I think we'd be mindful of that. Um, I think as well, one of the things we see in Israel are our prophets who speak truth to the, to the power, to the kings and say, king, you need to be trusting God, not trusting in the powers of Egypt or elsewhere, right? You You have to trust God that he is going to provide for us. And Keep in, and our security has to rest there. Um, and, and, and I think that prophetic tradition of speaking truth to power um, does carry over into who we're supposed to be um, speaking as the church, right? And so it's not, it's not a direct parallel of Israel into the church, uh, but there is some. Um, but I don't, I don't see any clear way of going from Israel to America, right? Other than the fact that some people have said that <laughs> to be true, doesn't make it actually true, right? There's certainly nothing in scripture that would lend us toward that belief, because uh, you can get into some really weird conversations, at least fuzzy conversations about what exactly a Christian nation would be and even look like. Um, that, that would be hard to imagine. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop. So let me ask you then, going back to this concept. Well, I'm gonna. Well, before I get to New Jerusalem, let me ask you this about the Christians in the first several centuries after the death of Jesus Christ was persecuted. I, again, reading the Book of Acts, I think it's around Acts chapter eight. There's they're talking about the scattering of the the apostles. Um, yeah. And so there was persecution. We know in the second century that uh, Perpetua and Felicitas were fed to the lions and they were not the only Christians who were fed to the lions. Uh, crucifixion right. was used not only for Jesus, but if we read one gospel account, there was a thief on each side of him. And so we have to begin to ask the question um, uh how crucifixion was used in the Roman Empire, if is if that's the the penalty for theft, like there's some brutality there. What we, so we, we see the persecution and then when the Edict of Toleration was issued by Constantine, uh, the persecution goes away, but what did we give up um, in terms of uh, embracing power, uh, uh, the empire uh, becoming what eventually would lead to becoming the 
the religion of the empire, what did we give up as Christians? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. I'm gonna go back to your mentioning the thief on the cross, thieves on the cross, the liestai, I believe is the Greek term. And, and we have translated that in a way that, that means something like robbers, but I don't think that's what's intended. Crucifix were used for those who were, um, I don't know if convicted is the right word, um, seen as um, com tyr committing tyranny, coming up against Rome's power, right? That's why Jesus is put on a cross. That's why those th thieves are there, is they've committed what is seen as coming against Rome, Right, and I think that's why that we have that story of in one of the Gospels about Barabbas and the releasing of Barabbas. Right, Barabbas being literally the son of the father. Right, and the choice between which son of the father are you going to choose? Right, and 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 it is a choice of what kind of power do you want, and the power we you know we want this kind of power. We want the the, the military might sort of thing. Right. And so it is an image, another way of saying the way of the cross is a way that is foolishness and wisdom, right? That Christians win through seeming defeat, right? And, and I think that gives us an ethic in terms of how we are to exist. We, the problem is, is our witness. I think that's what you're asking is, what do we lose in this? I think we lose our witness. The witness that God's kingdom, God's ways, God's realm is being birthed with new life, new values, and we get to be a part of that now and forever. And when we grasp power inappropriately, we lose the ability to point to God's kingdom, God's realm as different, unique, and everlasting. That's what I think we lose is the witness. Thank you. That's good. That's good. So let me then ask, what was the witness of the January 6th, 2021? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, it was so strange to see um, Christian flags as part of that event. Um, so I'm going to broaden it beyond just January 6th, even, because down the road from my house, I mean, less than two miles from me is a church. I'll leave it nameless, but they are um, infamous <laughs> in their claiming Christian nationalism, right? They've had political figures, uh, previous political figures, previous um, children of past presidents, <laughs> Um preach, and use that in, in quotes, um, at the church, and they have these rallies, right? And I see firsthand the witness that church has to the community, and the community is turned off, not just to that church, but to Christianity because of that church, right? That if that's what Christian is, I don't want any part of it, and, and that saddens me, right? Because um, I may not be um, <laughs> real prevalent on social media, but my wife is a little more and keeps track of it around um, local events. And to see the comments that are made, not just about that church, but about Christianity because of that church, gives me great sadness. So when I say we lose our witness, I really don't mean that just simply in a theoretical sense. I see it in my community, people saying, I want no part of Christianity if that's Christianity. And, and we are turning people away from new life in Christ when we grasp and, and claim Christian nationalism. So then let me go back um, to just, just dealing with this concept of Epiphany, Jesus being um, the revealed Messiah. Uh, mm -hmm. what, um, and, and we're, we're 
you you stated that claiming Jesus is the Lord was a political statement, and you are you're declaring what your allegiance is to in the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, is that still true today in America? Um, and could that have been a motivation for um, for some of what we saw on January 6th? Um, and how do, uh, you know, the kingdom of God is here on earth, this, this new Jerusalem, uh, I'm trying to, is, how it is interpreted in Americans' minds because of the founding of this nation. Yeah, I think that's one of the real dangers of Christian nationalism is its use of Christian language and Christian symbols, right? So it gives the appearance of Christian. I would say Christian nationalism, by and large, this isn't completely true, obviously, but I think by and large is often more nationalism wrapped up in Christian language more than it is actually in any sense Christian, right? That it's really just nationalism. And, and by that, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm meaning something along the lines of an idolatry of the nation. Um, first and foremost, before it's in any real sense Christian. But the danger is it, is it uses, um, I mean, we, we saw on January 6th, prayers in Jesus' name in, inside the Capitol as people were taking it over, right? People people using Christianity for their own purposes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm <laughs> showing which direction to go because there's there's a lot of layers to this onion, right? And, I'm, and, and I guess part of what I'm struggling with is how much I want to try and interpret people's motivations for January 6th because it was probably several things. But I do think, going back to something I said earlier, there is this sense of, and generically speaking, we have to be blessable in order for God to bless us and maintain this special relationship God has with America is their thought line. And for that to happen, we have to have promoters of this. And it's interesting to me how promoters is divorced from practice. I'm going to meddle here a little bit in places I don't necessarily like to go. But I think in the former president, one of the things that baffled me was a real lack of Christian thought, much less practice on his behalf. And yet people saw in the former president a champion, right? And, and, and that was confusing to me because how can someone who acts like this and say these things be your champion? And I, what I've come to understand is it was a champion of an of ideals more than anything, more than a character, right? I was very confused by the lack of character. Um, but what those who ascribed to Christian nationalism saw was someone who um, had the same ideals and promoted a cause of white Christian nationalism of um, in terms of which is yeah again there's so many layers here um it's contradictory biblically it's contradictory in ter- terms of our own civic values of um religious freedom of the freedom of the press and so forth and so on right so there's all these tensions that are involved in this um i'm going to stop again because i feel like I, I could go in several directions so am i getting at your question odell yeah, and and I, I just how do we come back from that brink? If Jesus is Lord was a political statement in the New Testament, mm-hmm. um, and there are folks declaring Jesus is Lord at the U.S. Capitol, how do we yeah. parcel yeah. out um, the political then? Because I mean, we can we can critique the reading of the Old Testament, but it is uh, it, it, we're now dealing with how. Even the 12 disciples saw Jesus um, because he had a zealot who was, you know, zealots wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And that was one of the 12. So how do we get uh, back to the spiritual message uh, from the political statement, Jesus is Lord? 
Yeah. So um, what first occurs to me is in the disciples, yes, we have uh, Judas Iscariot. And we have Matthew or Levi, the tax collector. How those two persons could coexist without literally killing each other is a miracle in and of itself. Those two aren't just extreme Republicans and extreme Democrats. This is further than that, right? The fact that those two somehow were with Jesus is pretty astonishing. So to Jesus is Lord, um, I think there is some direction here, right? That Jesus is Lord is both political and religious, right? It is um, it is saying our first allegiance is to Jesus and to the, excuse me, the realm or the kingdom that is being birthed through through um, through us through the, through the church through the Holy Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And that that's where our allegiance should be. That's where our focus should be, and we should then, I think, speak truth when power is being used uh, with corruption, when it's used to harm, when it's used um, in ways contrary to the gospel. We ought to be a prophetic voice to all governments, America's included, to as a critique to, to say um, that we're going to stand, we're going to be advocates for those um, who need that, right? Just um, as we serve a Messiah who was um, an infant and helpless, a Messiah who was a refugee, had to flee from political persecution to another, he had to seek asylum in a different country, right? We ought to be the people that are advocating for um, for justice and for the, for those without voices. Um, Am I, am I now am I hitting at where you're wanting there in terms of Jesus as Lord as not just merely a religious statement that we say in church, but has political implicate real world politic implications in in how we think about these things. And and one quick mm -hmm. add here is our baptismal vows. Our baptismal vows point us. I mean. If you look in the book of worship, and if those are part of your baptismal vows, that's part of what our vows are, right? Is to resist evil and injustice in all forms that they present themselves, right? That I, I, I guess I'll say this to, to finish here is those aren't merely partisan, but they are political, they have political implications. I'm gonna stop. I can mm -hmm. go on. No problem. So let's let's look at solutions then, um, because how do we get to, um, I guess, the understanding? If Jesus said, "My kingdom is not of this world." How? What are the potential solutions for Christians in 21st century America to understand that? Yes, the New Jerusalem will come down from heaven to earth and God's kingdom will be established on earth. But at until such time, yeah. we are not citizens of, of yeah. we're citizens of a new, to, uh, talk to me, what are potential solutions and, and, and understanding of the spiritual aspects that Jesus is Lord? So go to, going back to Revelation, right? And that question of, are you a citizen of fallen Babylon or New Jerusalem? And if we want to say the answer is New Jerusalem, that means then we live by the values of New Jerusalem. We live by um, the fruit of the Spirit. We live by um, mercy and justice um, and faith. That those are the guiding principles for how we interact. Those ought to be the standards in which we interact with earthly political kingdoms. Right. Um, I, I think an, an additional way of looking at this is what can we affirm? And one of the things we can affirm is you can be a Christian and, and be patriotic. Right. And by patriotism, I mean, be grateful for the places that we live and exist. So that wherever, whatever nation we're a part of, our ultimate allegiance can be the kingdom of God. And we can still be, should be active citizens of our 
the country that we exist in, our citizenship. And we ought to be grateful for when we have, as we do in America, the freedom of the press, the freedom for religion. We have these great political freedoms. And there's another caveat here is when we talk about the word freedom, we mean it in several ways. There's religious freedom, freedom from sin, freedom for love. There's political freedom, right? These are separate things. Um, anyway, we thankfully have those. And so as we can affirm that with others, right? I think we can also affirm that order and morality matters. Um, and we can affirm um, that, that we can, well, let me say it this way, we, we, there is some Christian influence into what the United States is. Like that, that's true. We can affirm that. Uh, we're not going to go, I wouldn't think, go so far as to affirm um, our founding documents to be anywhere near the influence or the inspiration of Scripture, right? Um, but we can affirm those things to build some bridges to say, let's, and, and really who I'm speaking to there isn't so much the adherent adherers to Christian nationalism, but there's actually a greater number that exists, especially in mainland Protestantism, of what's called sympathizers, right? And how do we speak to sympathizers and help them see the dangers of Christian nationalism and a better way, right? Um, I think that's, to me, who we are really in conversation with. I guess the last thing I'll say is, and then how do we live into our baptismal vows? Not just simply as individuals, although that's true too, we also have in the book of worship congregational pledges to those who are baptized, right? Baptism is about birth into a community, right? And so how do we, in those promises of the congregation, we promise to nurture and support those and give an example to the way that leads to life, right? So how do we as churches, are we supportive and encouraging and equipping uh, the disciples in our church, the Christians in our church, to see different gospels, to see when a different gospel is being preached, and to know when to, um, well, um, uh, let me back up a little bit and just say, the other thing I would advocate for is um, churches to do their due diligence in that role of nurturing and supporting. Because what research finds is that the more folks read scripture, the less likely they are to be involved in Christian nationalism. The more involved they are in the church, the less likely they are to be involved in Christian nationalism. The more involved in Christian practices, the less likely they are. So it's important to be about the work of discipleship as a way to undo some of this. Thank you, Scott. I think that's a good place to end uh, the importance of discipleship um, in understanding whatever our political, uh, we talked a lot um, about uh, Christian nationalism, but whatever our political um, stripe is, sure. uh, there is a discipleship, um, I'm going to say requirement of Christians so that we don't get carried to extremes, whether to the left or to the right. Yeah, uh, and I guess I'll say it slightly differently. I just feel like that word extreme is used a lot, right? It's like, who gets to decide what's extreme, <laughs> right? right? But I think you're right that, that we can be, someone can be a Christian and be a Democrat, someone can be a Christian and be a Republican. Like I, I, you know, I think you're right there. Um, we can have different stripes, but it ought, we, we ought to share a whole lot more in common and be bridge builders as opposed to demonizers, right? Which is part of Christian nationalism. It's, an, it's a radical us versus them, where, where I think one of the ways we can help is by, by being bridge builders. Does that make sense? Indeed it does. Indeed it does. Thank you. Um, for that. Um, I want to thank Scott Hughes for coming and talking to us about uh, the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of man, uh, and uh, how uh, Jesus 
will come and he will uh, establish, God will establish his kingdom here on earth. The new Jerusalem will be established. And I want to thank you for giving us a, um, a deeper and better understanding of that. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for the conversation. I always enjoy it. And if I can be a further help, please feel free to reach out to me, shoes at umcdiscipleship.org. Um, thank you, Odell. This has been a bit of fun conversation. Um, it, it is a bit difficult. Like I always say about Christian nationalism, there's a lot of layers to this onion, but it is an important one that we um, call out. So thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome.